Welcome everyone to this session on getting started with Fusion. My name is Stephanie Woods and I'm the head of training at, at MyLearning, the company that runs Fusion. Let's make a start. I'm going to assume that all of you are new to Fusion. So by the end of this session, you, feel, you, sh you should feel confident to come in here, set some homework or a task list, um, set up a group blog post and generally navigate your way around the system. This screen here is actually showing you the parent portal. And I wanted to start with that, A, to remind everyone that most schools do use the parent portal. The parents can see what's going on in school, depending on what your school's got switched on. So the school has a great deal of control over the parent portal and you can switch things off. But in this example here, this parent can see into their child's classes. They can also see into their child's My Files area or their task lists and homework. When they look at the homework, they can see the homework that their child has set for them and they can, al they can also see any grading and comments that you've made on that homework. There is a parent advertiser, so there's one for parents, one for teachers and one for students, but the parents can only see the parent one and the one that's for students. They can flick between those. These buttons at the top allow parents to, to read their notifications. There is a discussions module that allows parents to talk directly, to chat directly with teachers and there's a news channel there. So that's about communicating with the school and all of this stuff down here, is the parent looking into their child's Fusion VLE in a view only way. Okay, so that's the parent portal. Parents can come in here and change their language as well, just so you know. So if parents don't use English as their first language, they can change the parent portal so it works in their own language. Right, so let's have a look now at a teacher login. Up the top right here, I have an options menu with all my personal settings. Now you can see at the moment that I'm logged in with this dashboard or enhanced view and I can change it if I want to by clicking on layout and changing it to a button layout. It immediately changes and I just click back to home and you can see I now have lost all my dashboard panels. I just have buttons that take me to all the main places on the system. I'll just pop it back, layout, back to enhanced and home when you can see the difference. The other thing that I can do as a teacher, just like parents, I can go in and change my language as can students. So I can change my language to anything at all, including Arabic, which reads from the right. And I can go back and change it back to English as well. Even though I'm not on my dashboard now, you can see this icon at the top left. This is our quick links menu. And it means that regardless of where I am on the system, I can find my way to other features and other modules. The items that are large here at the top are the ones that appear in the quick links panel on the dashboard. And these are the ones that are extra. So if you can't see it in your quick links panel on your dashboard, the link to your various modules might be in here. Now my dashboard is made up of a bunch of panels and each of those has information in them. So I can see at a glance when something's new because it's yellow with a, a, a star and I can see all the things that are going on in my world on Fusion. You can drag and drop these panels or this menu up here allows me to move my panels around or add new panels. So you can explore those, but if I just want to move a panel Click there and save changes, but I can also drag and drop. So this is your dashboard management. This one here gives me access to all my main content areas on the system. So I can just jump straight to my classes or my learning spaces or my files, regardless of where I am in the system. Really, really simple navigation. Depending on what my rights are on the system, I can also access my manage button here. Students don't get this button, but they do get all the other ones. 
where I can very quickly and easily access reports and also the password manager. Teachers on the system do have the rights to change the passwords of students and to find the passwords of students. So it's worth just remembering that if a student's forgotten their login, you can actually sort that out yourself. There's also a quick create button here on the left. So if you just want to very quickly create something, you can come in here and create documents, quizzes, audio files, web links. You can quickly create homework and task lists, calendar events, and so on. You've also got a lot of help on the system and it's really useful to know that even when you haven't got access to things like this, there is a full knowledge hub of information in here. So you can come in here at any time and access this knowledge hub. So for example, if I want to know how to make a quiz on Fusion, just type in quiz, there it is, set a self-marking quiz. It gives me text instructions but also there's a short video. They're not usually more than five minutes long. I think the quiz one is maybe a few minutes more than that, but almost all the videos are less than five minutes long. Just a very quick, this is how you do it. Also at any time, if you need help, down on the bottom left of the screen, there's a chat function here, and you can click chat now and speak to people in the office. That's open during UK office hours, but we do start early and we also have a Sunday morning service as well. So half past seven in the morning UK time, right through till 4.30 in the afternoon UK time. So that's live chat. So if you just need some quick help, you're not sure about something, you want to just check something, use the live chat. If it's something that you want to report, you can raise a ticket and you can track all your support tickets here as well. There's also access for um, to useful documents here, more admin related documents, and you can also search the content of the system. So I can come in here and do keyword searches, for example, spider. And I can find all the documents on the system that relate to spider and it tells me where they are and I can click and just go there. So there's quite a powerful search tool on the system. Okay, so that's the navigation of the system. That's how to find your way around and get started. The next thing is the structure. How is the system structured? <clears throat> okay, so everyone on the system has their own My Files area. That's apart from parents, but students, teachers, everyone has their own personal My Files area, which is simply a file area that's just for you, where you save your files that you intend to use as part of your teaching and learning, or files that you're going to share with your students. This is where you would put things like images that you want to drop into homework and things later if you want to, you know, anything at all that you want to keep. This is only accessible to you, so your students don't get to see this area, this is yours. And incidentally, as part of that, you have access to your cloud areas here as well. So I can drop in here a link to my OneDrive and that gives me access to reach straight into my OneDrive, grab those files and bring them into Fusion to share with my students. I can also do that with Google and others. You can upload any sort of file you want to here. All of these files if you look underneath them, they all have a three dot options menu. And you can do all the usual things, delete view, and there's further options here as well. For any of these files, you can add keywords. If you upload a text document, it will extract keywords out of it automatically for you. You can make files visible and, and invisible, so the students can't see them if you want to. And you can also clone files in here. So lots of options with your files. If you want to copy a file to somewhere else, what I would normally do, come in here and just add it to the clipboard. Okay. And then go to the file area that, where you want to place that file. So I'm just going to use my shortcut up here, go to classes, okay. Go into my chemistry class. And I want to place that file here the file is currently in my clipboard, so I just click there, there it is, and add it. So that's how to 
copy files around the system. You can see anything that's new is yellow, so it's very easy to spot when you put it into a, a class where it actually is. I'll just navigate back to my files again. If I open up a file in the system, you'll notice that it's opened up with this bar along the top and that gives me my file options, including download. We've also got link, links to the file and you can link to any file using a private link, which means that whoever follows this link must be logged in in order to see it. Or where appropriate, there's also a public link. And that means you can send that out to anyone and they can click and view just that item, just that file, and they can't then look at the rest of the system. To close any file or other options, you've got printing, adding to the clipboard. You can also add an audio memo, attach an audio memo to any file as well, so you can speak over the top of it. You can close it here, but you can also just click on this bar and that will close any file. That's your file area. To add files, create a new file here, which is just like the create button that we saw before. I can add all these normal file types as well as quizzes and audio files, but I can also add files from here in this menu on the right. A very common one is YouTube. Just grab a YouTube link, click on that, drop it in here, and it will create a virtual YouTube file on your system, which will look and behave like any other file, but it is in fact a YouTube video. And you can drop those videos in here and you'll be able to just view them, drop them into homework or use them anywhere you want to. Other thing you might have noticed on the right there is we have Zoom and Teams links. So if you are running a, Zooms, a Zoom session for your students or a Teams session for your students, you can come in here and in the case of Zoom, you can drop the full meeting invitation in there and it will create a virtual Zoom file, which you can put into any class. And with the Teams one, you drop the link to the session in here and it will create a virtual Teams file on the system, which you can share with your students. All they have to do is just click on that file and it takes them straight to the session. You can also attach these files to homework as well and to task lists. You can upload files using the old fashioned method. You'd particularly use that if you're on a tablet or a phone where you can't drag and drop files. But if you're on a computer, you simply drag and drop files into this blue box to upload very quick and easy, including multiple files. And you can create new folders. When you create new folders, that's when you get the chance to create these links out to your cloud folders. So if I say new folder, if I just want a simple folder, give it a name and continue. But if I take this box, it allows me to create virtual links into my Google or OneDrive or Dropbox, etc. OK, let's go back home. So we've, we've got our own My Files area. That's fine. But what about sharing with students? We've got two areas where we share with students. We've got classes and we've got learning spaces. They're actually very, very similar. But we have two different options for a very good reason. Classes are created for most schools from the school MIS system. So when you click into your classes, you should see the classes that you teach only. And if your Fusion system is linked with your school MIS system, that will all be updated automatically on a very regular basis, like daily. That means you don't have to worry about your classes. You know they're always up to date, they're there, and you, can, you know who these students are who are a member of that class. So if I set homework for my English group, I know that those students are going to be a member of that group, and that's great. However, we do know that schools are very much more complicated than just classes. There's all sorts of groups of people in a school who want to share things. So what we've done is we've allowed you to create your own shared spaces that aren't classes. And there are lots and lots and lots of reasons and why you might want to create your own groups in here. So things like after school clubs, you might want to share a, a shared area for a, a trip that's coming up. Uh, 
that's an after school club, lesson planning, sharing plans between teachers, you can have a staff portal, you might have curriculum materials in here, all sorts of things. But the key thing is that you can add any people you want to into your own group and create your own group in here. Now you'll see that these groups have different icons. And there's actually three icons here. There's this one here, which is a dashboard. This one here, which is a file area. And this one, which is a website. So we have three different ways of looking at, at our groups. Okay, so let's have a look at these. The most simple way and the default way to come and look at a group of students, if I just go back to my classes, actually. Okay, so there's a chemistry class. So I can just click into my chemistry class. This is the one we saw before. And you'll be able to see that it's just a file area like any other file area. I'm sharing files with my students. They can drop in here at any time and just come and collect files, watch videos, do whatever they have to do. So that one there is an example of a virtual YouTube video, which is how to answer exam questions. You can see in here that I've also got folders. So there's one with videos, but there's a faded out folder with planning files in. So that folder there is for the two teachers who share this class to be able to share the planning. And this folder here is also faded out and hidden because it's, for, it's got past papers that I don't want the students to access just yet. And I can edit these folders at any time to unhide them, just to let you know. So that's a chemistry class, which is a file area. Go back to my classes. Another option there was websites. I can present a class or a learning space as a website. Now, I wouldn't recommend this is done generally. There's a little bit more involved in up, up and maintaining and, and upgrading a website all the time. But I would recommend it for early years. So this is just an example of, you know, the sorts of things you might do. It's a website and it has multiple pages and you can put any information at all you want to put on those pages. Okay. So that's website. And then there's this third one, which is a dashboard. So let's have a look at this one, learning English. So this is a dashboard for one class or one group of students that are sharing. The dashboard provides you with dashboard type panels, but all the stuff in these panels relates only to this group. So students can come in here and they can see at a glance everything that's to do with their class or to do with the group that they're a member of. So this is homework that's been set for this group, task list for this group, blog posts, forums, files. And um, there are other ones as well. You as a teacher come in and you create this and you add your panels and you just using the same dashboard panel tool that you use for the dashboard. But the other nice thing about a dashboard, you can add images, pic, um, videos, any content at all that you want to to the top of the page so you just go in and edit this this could be anything it could be a gallery of images it could be just a, a, a welcome and a hello from the teacher it could be anything you want but you have this blank space at the top of a dashboard to put content into this is fairly new on fusion and it's been very well received i know a lot of teachers like to present their class as a dashboard if you want to go into your files, they're still there. You just click on the header and it takes you into your file area for this group. So that still exists. It's all there. It's just that it's presented in a different way. How do I go about creating my own learning space? Although that's it, it's something that's quite important to know, really. So I'll go, and go into my learning spaces. On the top right, you'll see the plus. So I add a new learning space. I'll give it a name. I'm just going to call this, um, I'm just going to call it webinar. doesn't matter. So I've, I'm creating a new learning space called webinar. There is a, some auto enroll options for, for this, but they're very general. You can add all students, all teachers, all staff, but I'm not going to do that here. You've also got advanced options. These are the settings for your group. 
and these are quite important. So if you were going to use this group to set work for students, this is where you decide what the default grading template for this group will be. And that means if you set any homework or anything else for this group, that is the grading template you'll be presented with. And all teachers can do this for themselves. You can come into any group settings and change your own grading template. This one over here, group portal, this is where you decide how that group is viewed. Is it, group, is it viewed as the, the default files? Do you want it to be viewed as a website or that group dashboard that we just saw? So this is where you decide that. And you can also tag a group with a year group. It's also useful if you're going to set work for students to tag any group with subjects as well. And that means when you set homework, it will all already be tagged with the relevant subject. So that's a really useful thing to do. But really, to create a learning space, all I absolutely have to do is give it a name, go to the bottom and say continue. It then takes me onto this page. This page is where I choose the members of my group. Who am I going to be sharing it with? And the, the list of members is on the right. So at the moment, it's just me and the system administrator. So I want to add some more people to my group. And we have quick search over here. And the easiest way is to, you know, you can choose class groups or a whole list of students or all the teachers or whatever you need to, 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 to narrow down your search. I'm just going to generally add a pile of students into here. Okay. Now I've selected my students and I have three buttons along the bottom. This is where I decide what their rights are going to be, what their permissions are going to be. And from, as a general rule for students, we choose view only. Students come in here, they can see, they can download, they can use, but they cannot change what's in this, in this particular group. So that's normal. You might occasionally with students um, raise their rights to, to contribute, particularly during a lesson where you, you might want them to be able to upload files into that group for a while. You can always change their rights afterwards as well. The manager status is the one that I would always use for staff, which gives the staff the rights to do the things that they want to do with that group. But these are all students, so I'm just going to click view only and that will add them to this group. There they are. They popped over into the group as view only members. At any time, I can come in here and change their status. So I've changed Georgia to be a contributor. And that's it. I can go to my group. Here's my new webinar group, it's a file area and it's empty at the moment. And I could now go ahead and start dragging files in here and start using this group. I can start setting work for the group, I can do everything else that you need to do. Now every single group has its own group menu. It's available inside the group. And it's also available, if I go to the top end of my learning spaces, it's also available on all of these groups on the right. Every group has its own group menu. And this is all the things that I can do with my group. Now, every group has a blog and a forum already made. You don't have to create them, they, they exist. There's one blog where you can post multiple posts and have discussions with students attached to every single group as there are forums. This is also where you come in and manage your settings. So you can go back to that settings page we've just seen. So if you're finding that when you're setting homework, your subject's not tagged or you don't have the correct grading template, this is where you come in and change that. If it's a learning space, you can also manage the members of your group here. If that group is presented as a website, this is where you come to edit that website. You have the ability to message the parents of the students in this group from here. And there's a quick add to add homework, task list, blog post and calendar event for this group as well. I'll come back to the communication options later. Okay, so communication is a really key function of this system. 
So we've already seen that each group has its own blog. And I can start up a group blog post anytime just by using that menu I saw. The group blog posts appear on the student's dashboard or if they're using the button theme, there's a button there for their blogs and they can just go in and look at them. At any time, I can go in from the dashboard, click into a blog post and there it is. And you can see that's there for your students. If you're the teacher and you have the editing rights, you've got the ability here to create a new post straight away. And you can also add other people to be editors of this blog. When you create a blog, you have the option to allow students to comment, to switch on this commenting tool. And if you do switch that on, you also have the option to have it moderated. And that means that if your students comment, those comments won't be visible to anyone until you click to say they're okay. With blogs, the students can only respond in text. And that's the key difference between a blog and a forum. Forums are fairly similar. The teacher goes in, they put in your starter for 10, which starts off a, a thread, if you like. So this is a thread in psychology. I st started off the discussion at the top and the students get to respond. But this time the students have the full editor and they can put in multimedia videos. They can change the font size. They can do anything that you can do with the standard editor on the system. Now you can see with this one, it's green and it's got this shield. That means it's not yet been moderated. I need to click on that to make it visible to other people. Okay, so that's how moderation works. Forums are also available as our blogs from your quick links menu. And if I look at my forums in here, this is where I get to edit my forum permissions and settings. So I can decide, can students create their own threads? Can they edit, can they delete? And also do they, do they need moderation? So that's the two main ways that you communicate with students on this platform. And you do it by group, everything's about group. If you do want to communicate with individual students, you have a messaging option here. It's like an internal email and you can send a message to in individual students. And you can also set those messages to pop up on their screen so that they see it as soon as they log in. There's also a school blog and that can be written by the admin, the system admin, and also anybody who's designated as admin managers and for anyone who's been assigned to be an editor of that blog. That school blog goes out to parents, students, goes out to everyone on the system. Okay, so it's exactly the same as a group blog, but group blogs only go to the members of the group. The school blog goes to everyone. We've also got an inbuilt calendar system, so you can set calendar events for the whole school if you're allowed to, or for your groups. So if you, if you run the football club and you have a learning space for the football club, you can set a calendar event for that group and it will only appear to that group. Beyond that, we've got communication with parents. So if I just go back here, there is a full notification system where, for example, if you set homework, you have an option to, to set it so that parents and students are notified. There's, a, there's lots and lots and lots of notifications that you can switch on. Again, I recommend that the school doesn't switch on too many. You don't want to flood people with notifications, but it's really good. So during the day, five teachers set homework for a child. At the end of the day, the parent gets one notification to say, your child has homework. We also have this discussion tool. So the, the parent can initiate a discussion here with a teacher. So this parent has already initiated a discussion with three different teachers. And I can go in and view. These are all my various threads of discussion. So each of these has numerous comments. The parent can also come in here and create a new discussion and just choose from the teachers in the school who they want to start a new discussion with. 
Now, some schools like this, some schools don't. It's entirely up to your school whether this is switched on, but it's, all, it's an option for communication. The school also has a broadcast tool which will send out a message to all parents using a notification and an email. Our system does have an app. So if I just go back here, so if particularly parents, we do recommend that parents download the app and put it onto their phone. And that allows those notifications to ping out onto the parents' phones. So it's just to, to bear in mind that that's there. So we've seen that we have the school blog, we have the advertiser, we have the discussions, we have broadcast. And then finally, we have the ability to do the live sessions. So we've already seen that we can set up Teams and Zoom sessions and add those as um, files on the system. I think I've archived the, the homework that I set. But you can set homework, there you go. So that's an archived piece of homework. You can set homework where you provide the students with something to read, but also a link to the team session and the title tells the students what time the session is. And that's been set as homework for the students. So that's something you can do. By default, at the moment, and that's just at the moment, Fusion um, provides one room or one group of free online live video conferencing, similar to Zoom, but within Fusion called MLTV. And you or your student can go into a class, go to the class menu. And so this is the free version. You can go in and there is one room across the whole school which anyone can enter as long as there's a teacher in there. So it's something that would probably have to be timetabled if you were going to use this, but it's there and you can use it. You can choose to pay and to have uh, separate rooms for each single class or each group, every class and learning space can have their own room, which is exclusive to the members of that group. And you can choose to have that available for up to 210 concurrent users across the whole school or for 420. So we have that, that ability to set up video conferencing. Very like what like we're experiencing now, but it also has other built in presentation tools such as showing PowerPoint presentations and annotations on the screen. And as I say, you can also choose to use Zoom or Teams alongside those. What I would recommend if you're using live classrooms alongside Fusion, we have the ability in Fusion to set work for the students. So we can set homework, we can set task lists for students. That's where you give the students the work they need to do. So the live sessions don't need to last, to, to last throughout the whole lesson time. You can just introduce the session with a short uh, live introduction. 10 minutes, 20 minutes tops is, is long enough for those live sessions. And you can perhaps open it up again for the last five, 10 minutes of the lesson as well to ask the students if they've got any questions. Okay, so that's communication options. And finally, let's get to the real nub of the, of the system itself, which is homework task list, actually setting work for your students. Okay, so the most commonly used one that we have on our system is homework. So I come in here to my homework. I'm a teacher. I can see all the homework that I've set for my students. My homework settings are here or my options. So I can archive homework. I can copy it and apply it to another group. I can go back in and edit homework that's there. I can go in and look at my existing homework. So this is homework that's already been set. This is what our students see. This is the instructions. This is where I can upload resources to support my students. And this is my list of students where I can track their progress. I can mark their work. I can see their comments. 
So it's all in one place. All my marking and management of homework is all done from one page. So let's see how we set homework from scratch. So I'm just going to go to homework, add new homework, choose my group. Who am I setting the homework for? I can choose to give it to everyone in that group or I can pick out individual students if I want to do differentiation. Give the homework a title and describe what I want the students to do. This is my instructions to the students, but I do have options here. I can add images, links, I can drop a YouTube video in there. There's also a full new tool to set math symbols. And if I've forgotten to upload a file previous to this, I can upload a file now while I'm editing the homework as well. So instructions for students. Let me just see if I can find a video to quickly drop in here. Yeah, there's a Pythagoras one. There we go. So instructions for students. If you feel the font isn't big enough, that's no problem. We can just change the size. Absolutely fine. Then we've got our settings. By default, so you can see that because I set this for a geography group, it was already tagged with a subject. I don't, I don't have to do this now. The homework defaults to starts today due in one week, and you can change those settings. The submission type defaults to allowing students to upload a file, but you can change that to ask the students to submit by hand, or you can just have homework where you, you're not actually allowing students to upload a file. You, it's just an instruction. Go away and read a chapter of a book. Um, go and learn spellings, whatever it is you want them to do, they don't actually need to create anything. But the default is submit a file to the VLE. We have some additional options as well. You can add the due date to the student's own calendar and you can send an instant message to students saying you have homework. To be honest, they probably don't need that, but you can do that if you want to. Your homework's also automatically archived three months after the due date. You can change this date if you want. The school itself actually can change that date if it wants. So you could, the whole school can set it so one month after the due date, all the homework's archived. But really all I've done with this homework is who am I giving it to, title and instructions to students. Go down the bottom and say finish. So that homework is now out there and it's due in a week. This is where I get to attach files and this is really important. So if, for example, I've created a quiz for my students using a quiz file like we saw earlier, this is where I put my quiz. I just attach it in here and the students are given the quiz to do. If I had a PDF worksheet that I want the students to work on, I can attach it here. The students can still work in a book if they need to or want to. It's up to them. You can also attach template documents so they can just edit that document and submit it back. And down here is the list of the students in that class. OK, so I'm going to now log in as Georgia Fry, one of those students. And here is one I have earlier. I'll just refresh the page. OK, so you can see Georgia has new homework. It's bright yellow. It's called webinar. And she's going to click on that. She can see her instructions. She can play that video and watch it. OK, when she's done that. Now, you haven't submitted a file for her here. so. But if you had, it would be here. It would be any support materials that you gave her would be here for her. And Georgia can do her homework by uploading a file, going and fetching a file from her own My Files area, adding a file from the clipboard, or actually creating a file here and now. So if I come in here, I can create a Microsoft DocX document. I give it a name. I can put any sort of submission in here. So I'll just 
There you go. So that's her submission. She has the choice to save a draft, which will copy this down to her My Files area so she can carry on working on it and then submit it later. Or she can submit this straight back in here and now. There you go. So she's submitted her homework. As far as George is concerned, she's completed her work. She can actually choose to mark this complete herself. This helps her to see in her own list of homework what homework is actually complete. She can comment here or she can just say continue. And that homework has now been marked as complete. She can undo that if she wants to. But that means that in Georgia's list, she can now see that homework's done. Her parents can see it when they view her homework as well. And that's her finished with this homework. I then go back in as the teacher, just refresh the page, and you can see things have changed for Georgia. So let's have a real good look at this. So the eye icon now appears as an open eye without a, a score through it. That means Georgia has seen that homework. She's been to that page. So there might be students down there with just the eye but nothing else has changed. That means that student has been in and they've opened that page and they've looked at that homework. The yellow folder indicates that something has been submitted. The blue tick indicates that the student has marked this homework as complete. And over here, you can see this comments box has gone yellow with a star. And if I click on it, There's an automated message actually from Georgia saying that she's marked the homework as complete. I can add a comment, I can reply. If, if Georgia had manually put in a comment, which she can at the bottom of her homework, there's the option for her to add a comment to that homework. I can then come in here, reply, and we can enter a dialogue. We can talk about this homework together until we're satisfied that the homework's complete. I can ask her to resubmit, I can do anything using this commenting thread which is always here. I can open up the file that she submitted and view it. If I'm content and I think it's ready for grading, I can come up here and I can grade this work. And I can also go over here and edit this document. So I can come in here and I can say that word is misspelled. And you see this tool here that says the marking tool. I just come in here, I click spelling, and that marks that word up as being a spelling error. Or I want, them, I want Georgia to start a new paragraph just here. I can pop in new paragraph and so on. I can also add comments. and drop a comment onto the page. So I can mark this as much as I want to and I can just click leave feedback and that adds a, a separate file into Georgia's homework, which is that document edited by me, the teacher. Georgia can't change that, it's going to be there, it's preserved. She can edit it and resubmit, but that will resubmit it as a separate file. So it's an evidence base for the marking and remarking of that work until it's finished. So let me just go back in and, and grade that piece of work. I'll just give it a C. You can see that a C is, a, is associated with this percentage. I can up that percentage and eventually it will change to a B and so on or I can just go back to a C again. I can also leave homework feedback here for this particular file if I want to, but I'm just gonna save that grade. So this document has now been graded as C and that will, it's, I haven't refreshed the page yet, but that will soon appear with a C next to it. And you saw that with other ones. So Georgia might submit three or four different documents here and I can grade them all as we go. And then when we're finished with this homework, what I can do is grade her homework overall. And that becomes the homework grade. So I can just come in here and give her a B overall. Whatever it is I want to say, 
to Georgia. OK. And save. So you can see that homework has now been graded. And there's also a comment in there. I can export these grades to the Markbook. And that will bring all the homework grades together in one place. I can do that now, even though I haven't finished grading all the students. I can just export it to the Markbook and then carry on grading and all those grades will automatically be sent to the Markbook. So geography class, geography, export. Those grades have now gone to the Markbook and I can carry on grading other students and so on. OK, any questions about that homework process so far? Is everybody OK about that? Please feel, to, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one. Yeah, I've got a question about the, um, the comments, actually, the feedback that you have there. Yeah. So there's two places to do some feedback there. There's one within the individual work. Yeah. And then, and then one where you can see it right there. Yeah. When you then look at the um, reports, which of those comments appears when you then output um, an Excel file? If I, um, if I go to the grading centre, for example, yeah, yeah. and I choose, uh, well, there's Georgia there. Okay, so that's her webinar grade and it, it shows there underneath. So that's the, that's the homework grade. But any grade that I give her, that's the one that I graded her document. I didn't actually leave a comment there, but both of those grades appear in the grading center. So if you leave a comment on the document and then a comment on the whole homework, they'll all be both there. Of those, both yeah. of those comments will appear. Yes. Ah, and, and, that's, and that's grading related comments. But you've also got that other option of commenting, having that sort of commenting discussion, if you like. Yeah in the homework itself. Now yeah. this is this is an improvement that we've just brought in actually. So um, it used to be there in a way, but this is nicer than it was before. So this ability to just click on here and engage in, in a conversation with your students from this page is really nice. That's um, really useful, thank you. Yeah, okay. When you finish with this homework, when you're happy, when it's all done, your students have all done their thing, you've done your thing, it's all marked. You've got to manage that homework. So let's say it's, it's the day before or the night before it's due or the, the morning that it was due and you see somebody hasn't done it. You can tick and send a reminder and that will give them a pop-up message saying you haven't done your homework, get on with it. It's really important also to mark students' homework as complete. And that might not seem important, but what it does is it keeps a record of who has done that work and who hasn't. It's only three ticks. So if I go into homework, if I just show you there, so I'm, I'm in my homework, I'm dealing with my homework, I decide I want, I've finished with this webinar homework now, tis done. I just click in, select all, mark as complete, it's three clicks. Let's say Monica never did her homework. I'll just leave her out, but I'll mark everyone else as complete. And you can see it's not a blue tick anymore, it's a green tick. And that's the official completion of homework. That has said, this, hope, this child has done their homework. And then to go with that, if I go into reports up here, there is a report called homework by group. I think that was the geography group, wasn't it? Uh, and there you go. So there's the webinar. You can see Monica has consistently not been doing her homework all year, but other people have. This is a demo system, so it's not terribly realistic, but it just shows that this is all the homework this class has done through the whole year, and it keeps a record. This is something, you know, you, when it comes to parents' evening or anything else, or when you're writing reports, you can check on this, and it keeps those records for you. Okay, so that's homework. Um, one of the options there was also just to reopen the homework if you need to. So if you've marked it as complete and you realise they haven't actually completed it, you can reopen it. We're nearly out of time, but I just want to show you one final thing, which is task lists. So task lists are an alternative to homework. They're really about giving out work to do. 
step by step, do this, read this, go there, watch that video. It's about giving the students learning. It's almost, you can, you can imagine it, this one here is a bit like a lesson plan. So you can attach the learning objectives. You've got something for them to read, a quiz for them to do. And in this case, you can actually set quizzes so that they have to pass a particular mark to be allowed to continue in the task list. Task lists are also great. You've also got an option here for your own notes as well, if you want to remind yourself about something. Okay, but task lists are also ideal for things like um, revision. If you want to give students revision in order, what they need to be doing to, to learn things leading up to exam times, great for that. You can also assign task lists to staff, which you can't do with homework. So you can use task lists for staff CPD. If you are senior managers in a school and you've got policy documents that you want to make sure people have read, you can attach them to a task list, send them out to staff, and you'll be able to track who has done it and who hasn't. So if there's only one document on there, it would, and the teacher has opened it, it will show as 100%. So it's a really useful way of tracking progress on here. I can go into the student and I can see what they've actually done. I'll see it ticked once it's done. The student can't tick these without opening the file. They actually have to go in there and they open it. You can't check how long they've read a file for or how, whether they've watched the video all the way through, but you can see that they've opened it. So it's a trackable system. You can see what they've done and it's also possible as well to grade task lists, which is a slightly odd concept, but if you're using the task lists as part of a wider assessment, you can come in here and, and grade them afterwards as well. So that's task lists. Um, you know, they're ideal for younger students as well as older ones. If I just go in here, have a look at this one, you know, very simple. Watch a video, read this, do whatever you want them to do, but it's a very simple concept. To create a task list, very briefly, if I just go to tasks here, new task list, give it a name. We're seeing a pattern here now. Who is it for? Again, you can specify people, bearing in mind that you also include the adults in the class. So you need to be very aware of the task list all students will only set it for the students but if you use either of these two it will go to the adults in the class as well or the adults in the group so you can set one of these for example for the staff portal which means all members of staff so just to remind you of that task list start today you don't need to use a due date if you don't want to very very simple create a task list so i've created a blank piece of paper and I now just need to start adding my step-by-step -step instructions. What do I want them to do? New task item, give it a name. And I tend to use the title for the instructions. And then you've got this description option, which you can, or it's optional, you can use it if you want to. And then you've got lots of places where you can go and find the resource that you want to attach. You can add a file from within the VLE, you can upload activity. So let's say, for example, you want to send students off to contribute to a forum. That's one of the options in here. You can send them to a forum thread. Here's the forum. Continue. So I might actually change that to, but um, contribute, that's it. There you go. So that's it. Whoops. There you go, add task. And that's my first task. And I can now add more. So you can see, very simple idea. The students can already see this. As soon as it's done, the students can see it and start working on it. Great if you're taking students into an ICT suite to get on with some work. You can actually prepare everything for them in advance. You can give them the web links they need to follow and everything else. That's task lists. Okay, everyone, um, we've been here for an hour and I think that's about as long as you want to listen to this.
Um, I do hope you've enjoyed that introduction to Fusion. It's a very, very brief, quick overview of the system. And I hope that it gives you enough information to feel confident to get on and use the system, set homework and task lists, use the class blog or the forums as appropriate, um, start thinking about you know, how, you, how you communicate with your school community through Fusion. Thanks very much and bye-bye.